tā cieniem iet. Dear colleagues, it seems like most of you have returned from the lunch break and we can resume our work and we can start our afternoon session and now according to our program I would like to give floor to the host institution representative Deputy Director of the Latvian Ethnographic Open Air Museum, Martin Kuplais, who has been working here, I believe, from uh, late 1960s. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. Probably I will have a different view on uh, these um, issues that we are discussing since I represent a museum. But of course, we share the same problems. As you can see, the log buildings are quite uh, sturdy. You can see that they can withstand even uh, falling trees. But of course, with time, as we all know, uh, wooden structures have to be maintained and restored appropriately. And one of the possible approaches uh, in case of wooden structures, we can uh, disassemble them completely, leaving just foundations, because in this case we couldn't simply replace uh, some of the parts because also the foundation was partially degraded. So we removed the wooden structures. Afterwards, we manually reassembled by using the most appropriate materials that matched the originals. And here you can see the outcome of the restoration. And uh, this is just the recent five years that I will be covering in this presentation. And uh, of course, we have a lot of um, structures that have been uh, disassembled and reassembled here at the museum. And uh, we tried to uh, preserve their original structures. And in this case, we can see that six large beams support the tar kiln. And here uh, in the upper image, you can see the most important uh, turning points in the history of uh, this kiln. And some of the mm, parts have been replaced. And also the supporting beams have been uh, dug out and, and, and afterwards um, restored. Here you can see they have been reinstalled. And also the basic structure of the kiln was tested by actually igniting it. And uh, also here you can see another stage of uh, restoration. You can see also the, the beams, the supporting structures. And in this case, we have uh, a reproduced uh, the wood, wooden plank roof. So this was just one of examples uh, where we disassemble a building and afterwards assemble it back. In this case, uh, another exhibit of our museum since uh, mid-1980s, it has been at our disposal. This is a dwelling house. And in, in the picture, it's very difficult to judge, but uh, actually the whole roof support structure was quite deformed. And we conducted probing, we removed the finishing layer to see what's the situation. And what we found is that uh, some restoration work had been done already, 
and uh, but after removing these uh, replaced parts we actually learned that the wall was in very poor condition and uh, here we can also see what was the condition of the foundations quite often we can see the buildings from late 18th uh, 19th century we see these uh, masonry uh, foundations and if we go uh, lower than uh, the foundations we can see that uh, they simply end quite sh at shallow level and uh, there is no sufficient support for them so from the outside uh, they looked quite okay but as soon as we actually touched them the stones simply dislodged and, and uh, we could see that a lot has to be done and uh, thus uh, of course uh, it meant more resources for us both in terms of time and money to restore properly this uh, building and these uh, outer walls uh, also contain some replacement parts installed around 1930s and here we can see what is uh, beneath uh, the finishing of the walls, interior walls, and we can see that uh, they are in a very poor condition. So as you can see, uh, we removed uh, the lower levels of the wall, supporting wall uh, across the perimeter. Of course, we had to raise the building, put it on blocks. We also inserted uh, a layer of concrete uh, to strengthen uh, the foundation so that we can lower the building afterwards back on the foundations. And we also didn't straighten out uh, these ends of the logs because it was very clear from the very beginning that the building has undergone several uh, repairs and restoration works and all the finishing layers will actually conceal these parts. Actually, we managed uh, to have the one and only photograph which shows the original facade of the building and in the background you can see the same facade uh, which was deformed uh, uh, and prepared for uh, covering with the finishing layer but it was clear that we cannot return to the very original design and when it came to the phase where we could uh, put on the finishing layer uh, the question uh, arose: uh, why would we do so? It seems like this would be the only building in the complex to have this um, uh, wooden plank layer put on the outside. Then, of course, we tried to look for evidence to support such an approach. And here you can see the evidence that it was uh, a practice uh, in l certain areas of Latvia to use such uh, thin wooden planks, shindle-like planks, uh, to, to cover the outer walls of the building, not just for the roofing. Also here you can see a couple of examples of a, um, a similar approach and here you can see the high end uh, approach to, to this technique where, where they even contain uh, some ornamental uh, value 
And of course, we also have uh, a lot of windmills that also have been covered uh, quite similarly. Uh, these date back to late 19th century and early 20th century, and we can see that uh, this was actually one of the cheapest ways to uh, ensure the outer layer of a structure. Also here you can see a couple of examples of windmills. So here you can see the uh, um, most exposed wall, which we had to replace quite uh, extensively. So here you can see how this approach actually works in practice. And a similar method was also used in case of this shed, which is relatively young. Namely, this shed dates back to 1930s. And in 1930s, uh, there was a trend to actually uh, build uh, structures just for, for, for shorter life cycles. Uh, which, of course, also reflects on the structures. You can see that across the perimeter, we had to renew uh, the foundations to fortify uh, this uh, masonry foundation. Here you can see these uh, uh, foundations from which the shed actually has slipped off. Uh, here you can see how we also uh, installed uh, the scaffolding. And basically, uh, this uh, shed was hung on uh, this uh, scaffolding in order to raise it above the foundation. And afterwards, it was lowered uh, down. And uh, we achieved the perfect fit between the shed and the foundation with everything in the right place. And we believe that uh, this shed uh, will last at least one century from now. Um, but of course, uh, what concerns replacing uh, certain parts of wooden uh, structures here we can see an example of the uh, driving shaft of uh, the windmill. This particular part uh, was removed. Here you can see in what condition it actually was, practically di disintegrated. And uh, we made an exact copy or replica of this particular part. Here you can see the uh, original part and joined with the replacement replica. And also the attachments have been made according to the original designs. And here you can see uh, the last stages of the renovations where the blades are assembled on the windmill. And also, uh, in early 19th century and also throughout 18th century, the wooden plank roofing was quite popular approach in uh, rural Latvia. And uh, not only uh, rural areas, but also in towns and cities. And uh, we can see it in Ludza uh, town and uh, elsewhere across the country. Nowadays, uh, it seems like this approach has been has died out. But interestingly enough, when you use these wooden planks for roofing, uh, many people ask, how do you prepare them? How do you make these? 
long shindles or wooden planks for roofing. And actually what we did is we organized the training session in Foods. And uh, here you can see how we split uh, these beams, uh, the logs uh, actually, and then how we made these planks or shindles. And this is how we, we put them uh, in heaps so that they remain straight as they dry out. Yes, we stack them up uh, in such a manner. But nowadays, of course, it's very uh, difficult to actually obtain such materials. This is what we do on our own. And uh, whenever we uh, have to re renew the roofing uh, in uh, one of the exhibits of our museum, we prepare these shindles or wooden planks, which of course is a quite uh, an effort, uh, and it requires a lot of skill and uh, a lot of uh, high quality materials, uh, mainly it's pine. But it is doable, and in the result, you can see uh, what we, how we install the replacement uh, roof. So, if you uh, are interested in this uh, approach, you feel free to to visit the actual exhibit in our museum. And here we have another example which coincides with, uh, with what the previous speakers have mentioned. Namely, we start with the visual examination. Uh, we define what has been the original design. We have to define the, the objective or target of our uh, project. And of course, we have to select the most appropriate method or technique that we use in order to achieve the desired outcome. And of course, this means to attract uh, highly qualified um, specialists who are undergo training, uh, who undergo lifelong learning uh, seminars. which of course also requires adequate funding. So thank you very much for your attention. And in the conclusion, um, let me now uh, show you here on the wall uh, this drawing of the mansion, how it will, this is the building where we are now and here uh, is the building that we will visit tomorrow. Thank you. So thank you very much, Martin, for your insight. And since uh, you managed to fit within your time slot, and I received a message that one of our speakers has to return early, Namely, I'm talking about Peter's Blooms. So if you have the questions before he leaves, if you have some questions to Peter's Blooms, who talked about the Ludza synagogue, please use this opportunity because he has to leave, unfortunately. Yes, here he is among us. So if you have any immediate questions, uh, please use this opportunity. Otherwise, you will be able to meet him tomorrow. So uh, you may also save your questions for tomorrow. Let me just uh, add that uh, his presentation actually uh, covered a much broader spectrum of, uh, 
of topics than our seminar. He provided us with the background information about architectural and historical aspects of synagogues as such and also Latgale region of Latvia. So thank you very much, Peteris. So please feel free to, to leave whenever you need. And now I will give floor to the next speaker from Norway, Magnus Tenge, who will talk about the importance of the management plans whenever we are dealing with historic and listed buildings. So the floor is yours. Is green forward? Thank you. Uh, my name is Magnus Tenge, and I work as an architect in Statsbygg, Norway. And stat means the state, and bygg means building and construction. First of all, I would like to thank the hosts of this seminar for inviting me, and that's the state, this has to be right, the State Inspection for Heritage Protection of the Republic of Latvia and, of course, the Norwegian Riksantikvarn, and the museum, of course. Uh, I have to show you my disposition of this uh, short lecture. First, I have to tell you a little bit about myself, and then about uh, the Norwegian organization, and where do Statsbygg, where I work, and the Norwegian Riksantikvarn belong in the system. Uh, and then more about Statsbygg. As I said, no, Stat, Norwegian state, big building and construction. And then a section with uh, uh, my occupation uh, with uh, the operation and management uh, plans. And then the method on how we uh, develop them. And then a uh, very short summary. Okay, who am I? Uh, I work as an architect in uh, Norway, in Statsbygg. I'll tell you a little bit more about Statsbygg in a while. But the short story of Statsbygg is that our key issue is to provide space for government activity in the form of new built rehab or rental space. I got my diploma and master in architecture at the Oslo School of Architecture in 1992. And since then, my occupation has been as an architect in diverse companies, both on public and private side. Relevant work that led me directly into my current occupation was as an inspector and architect responsible for the maintenance and functionality on the old Norwegian rectories, the residences for the priests. I had the pleasure to drive around in our rather long country for many years and deal with these rectories. Uh, often two, three hundred year old wooden buildings. And that was a really unique collection of cultural heritage. And as I said, this led me directly into my current occupation as a project manager in um, Statsbygg. And my project is uh, operation and managing plans on Statsbygg's historic and listed buildings. Uh, well, the Norwegian organization, where do Statsbygg, where I work, and Riksantikvarn belong in the Norwegian organization? In Norway, we have a uh, um, a monarchy with the king on top. The king has his cabinet where the heads of the ministries participate. And that's the Norwegian government. We have the Ministry of Finance, Defense, Oil and Energy, and so on. And under the Ministry of Modernization is where Statsbygg is organized as a government corporation with the main goal to provide space for government activity and under the Ministry of Climate and Environment is where Riksantikvarn uh, is organized. And they 
advise this ministry and also deals with the development of the state's cultural heritage policy. Is that right? And then more about Statsbygd, where I work. I will not go uh, too much into details as uh, the, the um, lectures before me did. Uh, this is more an overview on how uh, uh, Statsbygd work and our methods. Uh, Statsbygd is organized as a public enterprise under the Ministry of Modernization with the main goal to provide space for state institutions. State Statsbygd also owns 140 listed properties, all including 450 listed buildings. And it's obvious that we need to have a good overview and control over this portfolio. We work on operation and management plans will, with a cultural heritage focus on all of these buildings. Statsbygd is big. Statsbygd has 900 employees spread around the country. And we are organized around five region offices, north, middle, west, south and east. We also have a special responsibility to promote good architecture, universal accessibility, preservation of heritage sites and preservation of the environment. Statsbygd is divided into divisions and tasks include construction, property management, that's where I work, property development, buying and selling, and consulting. And in the consulting division, we have our own cultural heritage specialist group. Statsbygd is funded by the government through a rent-based system called Husleiemodellen. In English, that would be something like house rent model. Uh, it's a cost-based monthly rent that all of our tenants and users pay to Statsbygd. We calculate a cost-based rent which includes managing, operating and maintenance costs. And in rare occasions where we have a combination of listed property, no tenants and therefore no generated rent, we have an agreement that some of the costs are funded directly by the government. To show you the span in our property portfolio from small and rather remote to large and more central, I will give you some examples. Uh, this is Svalbard Global Seed Vault, which offers secure stock duplicates of seed that are found in gene banks all over the world. The seeds are stored inside the mountain, and you see here the entrance. The rest is inside the mountain on Svalbard. The property is actually not listed, but I think it's somehow interesting and relevant uh, in the way that all, it's all about preservation and heritage. And inside these mountains, we preserve the heritage of the world's biodiversity. And uh, on the right, you have the government quarter in Oslo which was terrorized by a bomb attack in 2011, and today the repair and reorganization of the locations for the ministries is one of the largest projects Statsbygd deals with. And on the right we have uh, Austrottborgen, who uh, it was originally part of uh, a, a, manor, a manory, a big farm with traces from the 1200 period. Statsbygd manages this property in collaboration with the museum and the property is open to visit in summertime. And on the left we have the Norwegian Opera and Ballet. This already iconic building was built in 2008 by Statsbygd. It is already listed and it's one of the most profiled properties managed by Statsbygd. The design and architecture is done by the Norwegian architect Snøhetta. And we have, uh, this is all examples. The, we have the National Gallery on the right. Uh, many central culture institutions was established in Norway in the 1800s and many of them got buildings designed for their specific purpose in central Oslo. The National Gallery was one of the important culture investments that the nation did during this period. 
And we have an uh, example of a prison. We have Hamar prison on the left. And it represents the typical prison architecture and organization ideals from the mid-1800s. And how do we manage our cultural heritage on all of these buildings? In this complex question, I have to mention some key points that we have a focus on. We work on operation and management plans. That gives us the complete overview over our historic properties. That's the project I'm working on, and I'll show you more about it in a while. And we have a good collaboration with uh, Riksantikvaren. Thank you. Uh, and if a question about maintenance and repair is not answered in the plans that we make for the listed property, we can discuss and agree on them in monthly meetings with the Riksantikvar. We both agree that this really is an effective way of handling these questions. Riksantikvaren has a team goal called the state team who deals with these questions. We also agree when it comes to usability. The preservation of the historical heritage is likely to succeed if the listed buildings are in good use. It's therefore important to focus on the usability and to make the spaces functional for our tenants. Third, and probably the most important, as my, uh, the earlier uh, lectures told us, we have qualified property managers and operation maintenance personnel. It's very important that the personnel has ownership to the history behind their listed property and that they have the right tools to make good decisions when they maintain the property. One of the tools is now the operation and managing plan. The more knowledge you have about the building, the more conscious you will be when working with it. Maintenance is better than repair and repair is better than replacement. That, in fact, is a guiding light for us in um, our property management in Stadsbygge. And, of course, the operation and management plans helps our property managers to contract the right craftsmen with the right skills to do the actual work on the buildings. Then, operation and managing plans. I have to tell you a little bit more about the origin of these plans. Again, explained with yet another very simple drawing. In 2006, the king and the government decided to start up and implement the by far largest conservation project in the history of Norway. And you see Norway uh, over there. Called the National Conservation Plan. It was a systematic mapping of all Norway's state-owned properties to find out which one of them told interesting stories about how the Norwegian state has developed. To make this rather complicated story very simple, I will sum it like this. We had uh, first the mapping throughout uh, the country from south to north, and then the findings who lasted uh, a couple of years. Uh, the findings then was sorted and the work was submitted to the managers of, on the specific uh, properties. Stadsbygg got a long list of 140 properties and at that point we were committed to make operation and managing plans for all of them to fulfill the national conservation plan. That was part of the deal the king and his government did in the cabinet in 2006. Of course, many buildings was already listed because of obvious reasons, old age, special functions, and so on. The premise for the mapping project was, as I said, to find stories about how the Norwegian state has developed. And I will give you some examples. This is uh, far north in Norway. And it's called Grense Kommissariatet. It's a border station in the north of Norway. The building and architecture in itself isn't really interesting. But the story is. This is where the Norwegian and Russian border commissar had and still has their interesting discussions on the border between Russia and Norway. In fact, they take, play, they take place in that uh, room. And therefore, 
this property is listed. This is uh, another example. It's Bastøy Fengsel. Øy means island from the 1880s. It was originally built as an institution for troubled young boys. Hundred years later it was converted into a prison by obvious reasons. It's located on an island and it's almost impossible to escape, although some inmates have tried without success. It's a listed property mainly because of the horrific but yet interesting story about how the Norwegian state treated young troubled boys up to rather modern times. And then uh, the operation and management plans and how we uh, how we do them and how how they look. Uh, I will show you the very short story of how we develop develop these uh, plans and how they look. And I have a couple of them with me here. This is. Uh this is really not so complicated. Booklet. And once more, I have to show you a very simple drawing to explain. You remember the long list of Statsbygg's 140 listed properties. As an example, this one is one of the properties on that list. And at this point, we are going to make an operation and managing plan. First, we organize a working team on that specific listed property. And the team is the property managers and the operation maintenance personnel on that property. And it's Statsbygg's own cultural heritage advisors, both on building and historical gardens. And it's a contracted specialist within the specific historical topic. And me as the project manager. So uh, the working team is uh, five, six, seven, eight people. Then, this is a very short version, of course. Then the team meets and prepares and discuss the national conservation plan That's, that was made before we go out. When uh, we then get the same knowledge about the property's history and what to be especially aware of when we visit it. Then it's the site visit by the team. We visit the property and do the inspection. We discuss and take photos and do the necessary registrations on specific historic building or garden elements. The specialists also uh, suggests and describes maintain, maintain and uh, main, how to maintain the his, his, historic elements. The maintenance personnel also points out the usual maintenance and repair challenges they ha have on the property. And then third, the, uh, the contracted specialist writes the operation and managing plan. And the plan is actual, the actual output of all the preparations, registrations and the site visit. And the plan is divided in into two. Part one is on a superior level with a specific chapter index. One of them is, for instance, a historic uh, chapter and another deals with maintenance and repair challenges on the property. And uh, this, this is uh, an example of uh, uh, a plan on that superior level. And it's always 15 sites, even if the, the property is a small hut or if it's the king's castle. And then we have uh, number two. The part two is uh, uh, all the historical registrations on the repair and maintenance uh, and the repair and maintenance advice the specialists did on the buildings and outside in the garden, if the garden is listed. These are saved in a database, every registration. And we also print them out and make a booklet out of them. And this is an example of how that looks. 
It's uh, about doors and windows and uh, handrails and, uh, and uh, plaster, everything about that specific uh, property. And then finally the plan is submitted to the property manager and the maintenance personnel. The plan is now one of the property managers. Did I go uh, my file wave? Wrong way. Uh, the plan is now one of the property manager's key tools to, to, in histor hist historic preservation and maintenance on that listed property. And uh, you all see the, uh, to the right on the picture, that's uh, part of the team in action eating lunch around the campfire at a rather remote police station far north in Norway. At this station, the officers are mainly occupied with snow shoveling and once in a while with illegal snow scooter driving in the woods. The station is also located on the border to both Russia and Finland and visitors offending the border can also be a problem, but mainly it's calm up there. And this is how the plans look as you see. These are uh, then five of the 140 plans we are committed to make. The work started in uh, 2008 and by now we are halfway to fulfill the complete list of uh, 140. This year we are producing 27 plans. And I have to mention that all the registrations and the complete material is systemized and stored in Statsbygg's new digital management system called CESAM. And how that works is, uh, that's another lecture, I think. And already I'm, uh, I will have a short summary. So how does uh, Stalsbygg succeed in managing their listed and historical properties? Well, we have a focus on maintenance and repair plans that are really helpful. We have a good collaboration with uh, the Riks Antikvarn. And we have highly qualified property managers and operation maintenance personnel who are able to contract skillful and the right craftsmen. And the more knowledge you have about the building, the more conscious you will be when working with it. And, as I said, main, uh, to maintain is better than repair, and repair is better than replacement, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magnus, for your very interesting presentation. And we, you also saved a couple of minutes, so if someone has a very pressing questions, since I know we have uh, people from the state property management agency, maybe you have some immediate questions. And Magnus uh, mentioned uh, the number of properties, which was 140, and this reminded me of something else, because during the lunch break, a colleague of mine said that uh, in our inspection uh, altogether, we had 140 people following our seminar uh, online, so it seems like uh, we are covering quite a large audience, which is good. And now, uh, 
Of course, we also will have a coffee break during which you will be able to ask some questions personally. So let us move on. And now I will give floor to the next speaker, Eivind Falk, who represents the Norwegian Crafts Institute, who will talk about international cooperation and experiences in restoration projects. Thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to come. I am. Um, oh. There. No. There. My name is Ivan Falk. I'm director for uh, Norwegian Crafts uh, Institute. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk about some of uh, the experiences that we have from international uh, projects around uh, in the world not only in Latvia, but also other exciting places. Um, just briefly about our organization. Um, first of all, we started in 1987 organizing a register for craftsmen because it was so important to get an overview over the knowledge, the craftsmen's knowledge in Norway, not only according to buildings, but also other types of crafts small and rare crafts, shoemakers, glass blowers, wood carvers, uh, ladies making uh, folk costumes, all kinds of uh, crafts tradition, isn't it? So today we have like 3,000 craftsmen in this register. It's a very important overview. Uh, but that didn't help us at all to secure the knowledge or to, to secure the crafts because what we had to do was to organize uh, we just got the overview we needed to organize some training programs for craftsmen where older craftsmen that knew a lot that knew how to make traditional wooden skis would come together with younger craftsmen that wanted to learn so we organized so they could come together and work together and in that way the, the, the knowledge was transferred from the older craftsmen, the bearer of the tradition, to the next generation and secured in that way. Because it's practical, it's practical uh, learning, it's what we call action-born knowledge and the best way to preserve it uh, is actually as a living tradition uh, through a practical approach. Uh, then we organize a three years scholarships in, uh, in crafts which is a wonderful opportunity uh, for a deep dive into to some of the uh, some of the the, the white spots uh, on the sp white spots on the crafts map uh, and uh, like a practical research possibility for craftsmen on a higher level. We have been organizing uh, international projects in Czech Republic. In uh, Latvia, in, in Latvia we have both working with, you know, the Kuldiga project. Uh, per Willi told you about that. Uh, we worked with, a, we organized the Kuldiga uh, project from the start. Uh, and then we have also, we are now also finishing a pro project here in Latvia um, with a, the home of the, your famous national poets, Rainis and Aspasia which you know, yes. So their homes, their three homes, uh, we have been, uh, we have been uh, working with. Um, and I learned a lot. I didn't know, there was a lot, a lot of things that I didn't know before I started this project. Now, for example, I know of one, one, of, <laughs> one of the things that I've learned is the birthday of Rhinus is, how many knows the, the birthday of Rhinus? <laughs> 3rd of September, yeah. 11th of September, yeah, sorry, 11th of September, close enough, close enough. Okay, so we worked in, uh, in Latvia, in Hungary, in Scotland, Bulgaria, in India, Iceland, and also in Georgia for many years. Actually, since 2007, we've been working regularly in Georgia, and I will come back to that because I have some very interesting examples. 
to show you. Uh, this, is, this is what we do. We are involved in the planning part of the project together with our partner. Uh, we, are, uh, we have this, I told you briefly about our methodology, how we organize the training of craftsmen and experts and students uh, in the field uh, that, that, that is trained in front of or during the project. Uh, so, so, and then we also are drilling the restoration principles, which I think Shur told you briefly about earlier today. Uh, we are organizing uh, the, the, the workshops, and um, we are also assisting with publications. So some of uh, the outputs of our, uh, of our uh, or, uh, project has actually been resulted in some really nice publications. In Latvia, we made uh, for the, the Kuldiga project. Do you remember that, Ilse? Ilse is here. Uh, can you raise your hand, Ilse, so everybody sees you? Yeah, there you are. Uh, we made a wonderful little booklet with um, translation of tools, uh, name of the tools. It was a dictionary of tools that we made in Latvian. So that when Norwegian craftsmen and experts and, and Latvian experts and craftsmen came together to discuss, well, they could use this dictionary. This is, was one of the, and we also, we just uh, last year, together with Riksantikvarn uh, and the Georgian National Museum, uh, we published a book about um, um, preserving or restoration work uh, in, in uh, Georgia. So from time to time, we, we also do that. Um, and in this case, in this last case, and in some of the projects, we are also participating in the board of the project. In the, we, it has different names, but the name now in the Rheinis and Aspasia project is Supervisory Board. I like that a lot. It's a nice uh, name. Uh, this is, here we are in, um, here, here we are in uh, Jurmala. This wonderful little bathing uh, place, uh, which I actually was there 15 years ago, first time. Since then I've been there many times. Here we are together with the Norwegian minister, of environment and responsible also for the cultural heritage uh, and re related to buildings. Uh, so she was, she was so impressed by this project so she had to come and visit us and that was, that was really nice. Yeah, in the projects there are always there is always something to learn. Uh, we learn, our organization, we learn about uh, the methodology that is used other places. How do you train your craftsmen? How do you pres preserve the knowledge? This is always interesting to see how other people are organizing this uh, outside Norway. We learn about the use of materials uh, the use of tools, the use of tool marks. I think Perville also briefly mentioned that earlier uh, today, that when he came to Kuldiga, he saw that, he was amazed because he saw that it was so much the same. He saw that the, the small details from the blacksmith was so much the same that they had the same shape uh, in Kuldiga than it also had in Drebak, where he lives. So that was, for him, a really huge experience. And we learn about similarities and we learn about diversities. And this picture up there in the, at a, at a, in the corner, uh, on the top, this is from, um, we had this workshop in Norway, because we had, at that time, we had been organizing some, uh, some project in Czech Republic, in Latvia, and in Georgia. So we got some craftsmen together with Norwegian craftsmen and we're organizing uh, European axing dialects where we got craftsmen together from uh, different places and they, they brought their axes and had a practical meeting uh, in Lillehammer where, where we are situated. And, and what is, this is really important for us that we always include Norwegian craftsmen and restoration experts in our projects. 
So, as you know, this is, uh, this is Per Willi, uh, who were having a lecture earlier today. I told you about the Kuldiga project. And it's uh, Jarle Hugsmyr, which also has been worked in the Kuldiga project, but also has been working uh, with our project now, uh, with the, the, the poet's uh, home uh, for Rhinus and Aspasia. And uh, they, are, uh, they are really, I think both of them really have been enjoying uh, this, um, this, this work. And uh, got a lot of new experience. Uh, what, is, what is crucial uh, for the way, the methodology that we use, is that in center is always, it's all, it, it has always to, to teach craft and to preserve craft. You always, after our opinion, you should always have a practical approach. This is what we call, this is what we call uh, action-born knowledge. If this little lady, this little girl, she's going to learn something about, to understand blacksmithing, to understand what it is, is to, to make something out of the iron, use the hammer. And do you think that if she read a book about blacksmithing, would she get any clue about it? No. Because if you have to, she, she couldn't go out there and do the blacksmith work afterwards or to understand it. Because if she's going to understand a bit of this, she has to smell, the, smell it, she has to feel the heat, she has to feel the use of the hammer in her hand, the weight, and feel and see how the iron is bending under the guidance of the bearer of the tradition. So this is the way, not only for children, but this is also the way for other craftsmen. When you are, oh, I see, can we open a window, maybe, this lady? She needs some fresh air. Can you, you just, is it possible? Okay. Yeah, so you were doing like this, I'm sorry. We need to let in some fresh air here. No. Yeah. No, but this is, I think this is a crucial point, because not only for children, but also on a higher level. The, for craftsmen, also on a higher level, the way to uh, deeper knowledge goes very often through a practical approach. And a lecture could be fine, could be good. You could learn a lot from that, and you could learn a lot from books, and you could learn a lot from YouTube. But if you are really going to understand what it's about and to be a good pract uh, uh, practitioner on a higher level, well, you have to do the training for a long time and you have to talk to all the craftsmen, deal with bears of the tradition. That is the, the best way. And we use this methodology in our workshops. They are always with a practical uh, approach. Uh, from time to time, there is a question. Uh, when is uh, the tradition broken? And it's, it's, um, it's, it's um, very often we hear that. Well, nobody is doing this anymore. So many times we heard that. There is nobody, no practi practitioner of this. We have to invent something new. There is nobody to ask. Okay, so I'll tell you this story. We are now in Norway, um, and we are back to the stave churches, the time of the stave churches, thousand years ago, roughly, plus minus. And what, what uh, Schur and his colleagues and the craftsmen found out when they started to investigate the stave churches, they found that there was a special tool mark there was a special tool mark there. And they called it, they didn't know what to call it, so they had to, they, there wasn't a name for it, so they had to find a new name. It, you can see it here. Mm -hmm. This, here. And this is a same church. Okay. So they had to f figure out a nice name for it. So what do you think it looks like? Well, I'll give you a fish, fish bone. It, they called it fishbone pattern, or spretteterjing in Norwegian, but it has got a name now. 
So this is what they, they, they have to get a name for it. And they try to find out how they should do that. Because if you are going to do restoration the proper way, and if you are going to, you have to understand what the people, the craftsmen before you have done. So the craftsmen started to train and to organize workshops and bring in old axes and try to find out how has this been done? How were they standing when they were making this, uh, when they were making this uh, tool marks? How, w what kind of axes did they use? And how did they do it? And they wasn't su very successful. They went to Russia to investigate it there and they went all around to try to find out how was this done? Because it was a dead tradition after 1350, which was the Black Plague in Norway. After that, there are only some brief, uh, brief um, uh, um, uh, findings. But so this was this was really a big issue, and we used a lot of money to try to find out to figure out how this was done. And then, and now. As you remember, um, I'm going to talk about the output of international projects. So then Hans Marim threw up there. He, has, he had been working both with the medieval project as a craftsman, and he had also been working uh, with the state church program. So he had, been, he had seen a lot of these marks. I mean, he has no, probably no one in Norway, or maybe in the world, we thought at that time, had seen so many marks of the fishbone pattern. So what we, when Hans and I, we were working, to, we have been working together in Georgia for many, many years uh, as a team, and then you can see what we discovered on our second day in Georgia was that in this 200 years old building, old building, we saw the marks on the wall, and Hans put his flashlight there, and he says, "Oh, it's fishbone pattern, it's the, it's spreadetarying." Uh, he said, "Spreadetarying." It's, det er jo sprettet her i en jo, sa han. Han er fra Tinn. Han er fra Tinn, en liten plass i Norge. Og da vi startet å finne det, vi fant det alle. Det var alle over disse marks. Alle over disse marks. Og da vi startet å lukke for det, og vi spurte dem, er det noen praktisjener som er fortsatt det i Georgia? Og vi startet å lukke for det, og vi gikk på ekspedisjoner. Ut i rundt, og... This was in a cooperation with both the directorate and with UNESCO, and they were really eager to, to find this, uh, to find, if you could find a, a practitioner. And then we found some that were very close, but I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't really, like we didn't find the perfect one until two years ago. You see this man up there. I have this, if you go into, um, I have a link on, uh, on YouTube where he's standing and cutting uh, in this way. And he was like 87 years old. He was living in the, out in the, we had to drive for a long time, out in the forest, and he was doing this. And this was a living tradition. And as you know, and he had learned it from his father, who had learned it from his father. And then I will tell you another thing, that thousand years ago, uh, you maybe heard about the Norwegian Vikings. They went all over, probably also here, but they, they went also all the way to, to Georgia. Uh, they, they went also to Georgia. And then we know that actually there was a lot of Norwegians there uh, during that period when the fishbone pattern was at its most popular in Norway. So now we can see the migration theory here <laughs> has the fishbone pattern traveled from Georgia to Norway, or from Norway to Georgia? Or has it popped up two places at the same time? We don't know. But so far, we don't know. But nevertheless, we know that the connection between Georgia and Norway has been really tight. Um, and so for us, this is a very interesting finding. It's a very interesting finding. So this, the, the international projects helps us to put the puzzle together. So w through working with Norwegian, no, through working with international projects, we learn, we get new information because crafts is without borders. 
A building is also always inside, it's always in a country or in a municipality or something that has, are responsible for it. But crafts has been always a living, traveling tradition all over. So this is why when we are filling out the picture, finding the white spot, the missing uh, pieces in the puzzle, it's always something to find through the international uh, cooperation. What's in it for us? Why, do we, why, do, why are we working with international projects in our organization? Well, I think it's important experience for our staff in our organization. I think it's a good way for Norwegian experts and craftsmen to, to, to get this possibility uh, of new experience and a broader view. Uh, and I think it's, for us, it's, as I mentioned, it's crucial to involve uh, Norwegian craftsmen, always do that in the projects and in the programs. And we are building competence in our own organizations. Since we started, we had uh, we ran English classes. Some of some of in our staff were um, a little reserved working with uh, international projects. But then uh, we started with some English classes and some possibilities for for training for uh, for uh, for uh, be feeling more secure going abroad. And, th and now some of them are the most. Uh, the, for them, it's, uh, this, the, the international project has been some of the most uh, important experience in, in their work. Um, then I feel that through the projects we are creating uh, possibilities for new cooperation. I think that the, the project that we are in now, well, we wouldn't be there if we hadn't been in uh, the, 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 the former project in Kuldiga. And of course, uh, I think it it's maybe sounds a little like I'm like, um, um, making this picture a little bigger than it is, but world peace. I think that when people are actually meeting over the borders, visiting other countries, get to know new people, well, we learn about uh, different ways of living, different customs, uh, different people. I think the meetings between people are the most important and it would be impossible to go to war to, to Latvia after, after these two projects. For Norway I think it would be really impossible. Uh, but, but, but really I mean it and I asked Jarle Hugstmir which is, is uh, working and uh, have been working now with, with this project in, uh, with, a, with a poet's home. And I asked him yesterday, when we were having a beer, uh, and I was asked him what was the output of the project that you are appreciated the, the most. And he said, well, I did, he didn't actually say world peace, but he said that it's, uh, it, the, the meeting between people, the meeting between cultures and different ways of thinking and different approaches to our work is maybe, is maybe uh, what for him was uh, the thing that he ranked highest. And, of course, it's fun. <laughs> and this is from the last meeting in our supervisory board from yesterday. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Thank you, Avent, for your very optimistic and broad view on strengthening craftsmanship. Perhaps someone has any questions for Avent? We could use the opportunity to ask a question right away, if there are any. So please wait for the microphone. The 
So uh, my question about this uh, link with uh, Georgia. So we'd like to think that Georgia is uh, somehow linked with us, but perhaps it uh, the actual what happened was that they just separately came to the same uh, method. So perhaps if does there really need to be this cultural exchange over thousands of kilometers? Is it not possible that they just simply arrived uh, on their own at the same method? That might be a, that might be a, um, that might be an answer, but we don't know. We know that it was popular in both Georgia and Norway at the same time. Um, so, so that that is what we know, and um, but we we don't know the, how it has migrated, and we don't know how the how it uh, happened to start in Norway. We don't know how it happened to start in Georgia. We just know that it was very popular. At the same time, we know that the tradition was broken in Norway because of the Black Plague, and we know that it continued to live in Georgia. So that, was, that is what we know. Uh, if, but of course, it would be very interesting to find out, uh, to go deeper into that. Yeah. Yeah, this work? Yeah. Uh, when um, uh, Mr. Bloom was uh, speaking this morning, he was uh, commenting that uh, in the project he showed of the synagogue in uh, eastern Latvia, the locals had virtually no relevant craft schools for him. Uh, I was wondering, at an international level, are you seeing that uh, in certain regions uh, it's uh, very apparent that uh, they're very... Uh, 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 skilled in certain schools, so that uh, do certain regions stand out as places of uh, a high skill level in certain fields? Uh, and which uh, your comments on that? Uh, yeah, I can, I can do that because question. this is this is a very interesting question, because that has in our project because we have been running like 500 projects from uh, 1987 87 and f until today, and what we very often we discover that I can I can if you have time for one good example. I will give you one example. Because we heard that now it's the last man, the, the last bearer of the tradition, and he called us and he said that I have this special way of covering the barn here in my, on, on the island where I live, which is called Ustere. There, I am the last one who know how this was done because I saw my uncle do this. Okay, so we, and I'm very old, so we have to come. And uh, you have to do some documentation of my work. And then we got together craftsmen who were interested in that, and they wanted to learn how to cover. And it was a special way of covering the barn. They used juniper. You know juniper? Yeah. Uh, and they started to, to, to work, and there was, a, there was a workshop, and we organized it, and it went for weeks. And then they wrote about it in the local newspaper. And then suddenly one day, and it showed up that this man, he hadn't actually done it himself. So he wasn't actually a craftsman, but he had seen his uncle do it. But then one day, there was this very old man coming up the road, and he had read the newspaper. And he had his stick like this, mm -hmm. and he came up, and he said, it is like that. I know how to do this. I did this with my father. And he just threw, about, threw away his stick, and he started to work, and he showed them how to do this. Uh, so very often we think that uh, the, the knowledge is extinct, but when we start to dig and it gets attention, it shows that actually there are some people out there who knows a lot. And there are pieces, some knows a lot, and some knows just little, and when we put them together, like the puzzles that I showed you, then we get, we understand the whole, or more of the whole. But there are still many white spots on the crafts map. But this is an example. But it doesn't, of course, it doesn't mean that this is, the, this is what happens in all, uh, every time. But from time to time, it happens. People tell us there is nobody who's, uh, there's no practic practitioners left in this field. But then, when we start to dig, well, 
There are. Thank you. Are there any other questions? So, thank you once more, Avind. I think I think that altogether we have earned a dose of fresh air and coffee. As to Vikings in Georgia, that would be a separate discussion, on my opinion. <laughs>